So the fact that I study addiction and I make wine, my best friend says that makes me the breaking bad of the of the of UC Davis. <clears throat> So I'm going to tell you today a little story about uh, something I've been working on for almost no problem. It is on, but not high enough. Better? All right. Almost 20 years, and that is our studies of substance abuse. And I'm going to start by saying why, why study addiction? So when I say addict, how many of you see this person? Raise your hand if this is the person you see when I say addict. Right? You don't see that person? Or that one? Or that one? Right? Addicts are not people sitting on the street corner anymore. Addicts, it's a real disease. It's a disease that affects a huge number of people in our population. There's, the word is one in every three families is affected by this disease. So. Raise your hand if you've been affected by this disease, by someone that you're close to you or someone in your family, right? It's as prevalent as, as cancer, as dementia, as pretty much everything else now. And it is a disease that is certainly for the opioids, which I'm gonna tell you about today, a complete and total reflection of the fact that we have not just an epidemic of opioids, as far as opioid addiction, but an epidemic of pain. Because we don't have anything else other than opioids to treat severe post-surgical pain, for example. Ibuprofen isn't gonna cut it. How many of you have had surgery that has required major pain medication? How many of you have an opioid? So that would be Norco, Norco or Vicodin or Percocet. All those are opioids. How many of you are opioid addicts? How many of you are shooting heroin? Right? <laughs> so again, it's a, they, are, they have, these drugs have real legitimate purposes in the human population. And right now, we don't have anything else better. So what we really want to do is understand why we're becoming addicted to these drugs, and if we can do better, making, for example, opioid therapeutics that are less addictive. I, so I'm gonna tell a personal story. Someone told me today they really liked that I started with a personal story. So I'm gonna tell the personal story about a good friend of mine who was a really important mentor for me when I was a graduate student. He was a postdoc in the same lab where I was. He is now a famous scientist, not here at UC Davis, somewhere else, full professor, leading a perfectly great, functional, highly functional life. But before he was a graduate student, he was a stand-up comedian and a serious drug addict. And he fought that disease for years and got himself clean and got a PhD and went on for a fully productive life. But he tells me that every morning he wakes up and he still craves drug and he is 45 years clean, almost 50 years clean at this point. That is a disease of a problem of memory. Right, so we're all talking about memory here. We're talking about memories like, that was a fearful experience and I'm remembering that the next day. But this is memory that is memory 30, 40, 50 years long memory. And the other way I can put that is, let's have you all imagine a really important memory. So we're gonna talk about this, this is a disease of memory. Think about a really important memory. It can be a good one, it can be a bad one, something really, really important to you. Now forget it, right now. Just will yourself to forget that really important memory. I just want you to do that because that's what we expect drug addicts to do. Just use your willpower and get over it. Right? Not that simple because it's a memory and it's encoded. And this is what the epidemic looks like. And the epidemic looks like this, not because opioids haven't been around for a long time, because we've been using opioids since 1809, right? In the form of laudanum from a poppy. That's just morphine in a poppy. But we have this epidemic because we have an epidemic of pain. And let's see if I can get this on so I can actually use the pointer. Somebody can figure that out for me. <laughs> so we have this, this huge increase, and this huge increase is because of increased subscriptions of prescriptions of opioids. Is it working? Yes, it is. Because there are things like pharmaceutical companies that say this is a less addictive opioid, but it's really not. But that's not really the problem, right? The problem is not that opioids are inherently evil. The problem is, is that what are we going to do to stop this epidemic? All right, so we're concerned because so many people are dying of opioid overdoses. That's why it's all over the news now and why we have 
congressional meetings and we have money being thrown at trying to block the incoming drugs across the border and we have all this news because of the overdoses. But that's the end, right? Overdose is the end result. It is not the disease. It is simply a, a symptom. First time users don't kill themselves on opioids. The first time any of you, who, all those of you who had opioids, the first time you took that opioid, did you die? Or did you feel wonderful because it took your pain away? You felt wonderful because it took your pain away. Right? Everybody's talking about this overdose epidemic, but they're not talking about addiction itself. They're not talking about the underlying cause of the problem. Efforts to prevent overdose deaths are only treating the symptoms. They're not actually treating the underlying disease. So what is an opioid addiction? Right? So I think we have to start by defining that. And it's not merely liking, liking or using a drug. You probably liked it when you took that opioid and it took your pain away. You probably liked that a lot. But you didn't become an addict just because you liked it. There's no diagnostic test. This isn't like cancer where we can do a tumor biopsy. This isn't like diabetes where we can check your blood sugar. This isn't like a disease like that. This is a syndrome that has to be diagnosed based on a series of symptoms that you have that are personality traits, right? How many of you, raise your hand if you think that you know somebody who has an addictive personality, right? What, is, what the heck does that mean, right? I mean, there's no such thing as a personality. They're just the neurons in your brain firing in a specific way. So it's a clinical syndrome, and it's characterized specifically by loss of control of your drug-seeking behavior. So a really high motivation to take the drug, paying lots of money to get small amounts of drug, persistent use despite negative consequences, including loss of your family and jail, and it's a progressive and chronic disease that requires extended experience that is, extended experience is usually necessary, and there's a very, very high rate of relapse. So that is really the problem, because we can get anybody over we can throw anybody in jail and take their drugs away from them. But that doesn't get us past the problem that they're going to spend, like my good friend, 45 years, waking up every morning and feeling like he could really use another hit of something. All right, so what we have is the DSM-5 criteria, and we have a cycle of substance abuse. And I'm going to call up my daughter for a second, who's here today, my 13-year-old daughter. I'm going to have her stand here, and I'm going to have all of you stand up, and we're going to talk about the cycle of substance abuse. So stand up. If you want to play along, put your hands on your shoulders. All right, and now we're going to take an opioid. Woohoo! Throw your hands in the air. And then it's going to wear off. Take your hands to your shoulders. Now I feel fine. Throw your hands in the air. Woohoo! Opioid! Back to your shoulder. Ooh. Throw your hands in the air. Woohoo! Feels great. Okay, now go back down to maybe your on your armpits. Armpits, not shoulders. Now go woohoo, but it's not quite as high. Same distance, but not as high. Come back down to your waist. Woohoo! Same distance, but to your shoulders only now, right? Because you can only go so high, because you just took the pill, it only went so far. So how do you go back up to woohoo? More drug. Woohoo! Okay, back down to your shoulders. But you're not going back to your shoulders because it's worn off and now you're at your waist. That's what happens when you've worn, the drug's worn off. Now you're at your waist, you're not at your shoulders anymore. And that's because you use drug repeatedly, right? That is what is happening with this cycle of substance abuse. So go back to your shoulders. Now we're going to go exercise. Lots of endorphins. Woohoo! To your shoulders. Again. Woohoo! To your shoulders. Woohoo! To your shoulders. Right? Do you want to go back to the gym and go woohoo again? Yeah? Are you going to crave that woohoo because you're sitting there on your shoulders? You feel pretty good with your hands on your shoulders, right? Now put your hands on your waist. Do you feel good there or were you feeling much better on your shoulders? On your shoulders, right? So. You're at your shoulders, if you're exercising, getting lots of endorphins, you go up, you come back down, you go up, you come back down. The up is not the problem. The, whatever adaptations are happening that takes you from the shoulders to your waist, that is what addicts have. And now the addicts are living their life with their hands on their waist, and all they need is to get back to the shoulders. And what we need to understand is how do we design an opioid drug that gives you woohoo, <laughs> but not the adaptations that are taking you back down to your waist. OK, you can all sit down. <laughs> all right, so this is the cycle. My beautiful graduate student, Sarah Gooding, made the slide. She's the one running the, the neuroprosthetics booth over there, too. So you should try that out. This is acute drug use, right? You use a drug, but then you need more drug than before because now your hands are on your waist, right? So I take more drug because tolerance is developing. So I increase my intake, I increase my intake, I take more and more drug because I'm getting tolerant. 
Then I stop using the drug, and what happens? I stop using the drug. Are my hands on my shoulders or are my hands on my waist? On my waist. Felt really, really bad, right? I want to be back to my shoulder, so I got to take drug again to do that. So I have withdrawal symptoms because my hands are in my waist. These are fevers, they're chills, they're sweating, there's muscle pain, there's vomiting, diarrhea, anxiety. These are all terrible, terrible things to feel while your hands are on your waist. And all you want to do is have your hands back on your shoulders, right? So what do you do? I feel bad when I'm not on my drug. So I take drug again, right? So this is the big picture scientific question. Right? The big picture science question is why do we get addicted to painkillers but not to our endorphins? Why can't I go woohoo, woohoo every time I go to the gym? and never have my hands drop back down to my waist. Why can I do that with exercise or sex or great food or all the other things we find rewarding, but I can't do that with the opioid drugs that I take? And if we can figure that out, we should be able to design opioid drugs that we can use for pain that won't cause these problems, that will let you keep your hands on your shoulders. All right, so. Why do all, the other corollary of this is why do only some people become addicted, right? Raise your hand again if you had an opioid. Raise your hand, keep your hand up if you're a heroin addict, right? So why do only some people who take these drugs become opioid dependent and addicts? The scientific goals, the specific scientific goals are to identify what the changes in the brain are that are important for the side effects. And by side effects, I mean the tolerance and the physical dependence and the craving and the relapse versus the beneficial effects of the opioid drugs, where the beneficial effects are the pain relief and the reward, right? So how many of you here think if the drug is rewarding, it's going to be addictive, right? But I just told you, endorphins are greatly rewarding. You all know that because those of you who go to the gym or those of you who eat great food or those of you who do lots of rewarding things, those are mediated by endorphins and you're not addicted to those. You go up and you come right back down again and you go up and you come right back down again. And then the, the secondary goal here is can we reverse or block these side effects without compromising therapeutic utility? And by that I mean without compromising the ability to treat pain because these are the drugs we have for that. All right, so to try to address this question, and I have been trying to answer this question, I have been working on answering this question for more than 20 years. And to start there, we have to have a little diagram of what we're talking about here. So this is, where, what are opioids and where do they work? So the lock, the lock that you have to access with whatever the key is, is the mu opioid receptor. This is a crystal structure of that, which is a whole lot more complicated than that. So from now on, they're gonna look like this for my from my talk. They are molecules that sit in the membrane of your neurons, and this is the outside of the cell, and this is the inside of the cell, right? And what they are designed to do is recognize things on the outside of the cell and tell those things to the inside of the cell, like stop feeling pain. So this is what your body's endorphins look like. These are, they are these giant peptide-like molecules that the cells in your body, in your brain make. They make these endorphins. So when you exercise, your body releases lots of endorphins. When you're in pain, your body releases lots of endorphins. That's how your body deals with the fact that you're in pain. So they look like this, these little green circles. They don't really look like this, but I'm gonna take this complicated molecule, make it a green circle. It goes over here to this lock. It turns the key and it sends a signal to say, stop feeling pain. Morphine is a, nat is a gift that nature gave to us, right? It is a key that doesn't look anything like this key that fits in exactly the same lock. And it's the only lock. All the effects of morphine on reward, on pain relief, on, on diarrhea, because that's when you take modium, you're just taking an opioid that doesn't cross your blood-brain barrier and blocks all the opioid receptors in your gut, does exactly the same thing as endorphin. It acts as exactly the same lock. It goes over there flies up here, binds to this lock, turns the key, and says, feel no pain, just like endorphin does. So why is an endorphin addictive? Why can you go up and down and up and down with endorphin, and you can go up and come here, and then only come up this high and then down here? Why do you do that with morphine and you don't do that with endorphins? That is the big picture scientific question, and that is the mechanistic way, the way we're gonna dig down mechanistically to try to figure that out. 
This is a scientific example of exactly what I just told you, that you become tolerant and dependent to morphine, but you don't become tolerant and dependent to endorphins. Right? So the details are less important than the, way, the direction that the lines go. This just measures analgesia or pain relief here. We give either endorphin or morphine to a rat, and we give it a, a dose where it's giving you the same pain relief on day one. And then we give you morphine for five days, and by day five, you're no longer getting pain relief with morphine, and you're getting as much pain relief on day five with endorphin as you did on day one. Right? So that's tolerance to morphine and not tolerance to endorphin. These are physical signs of dependence that we can measure in a rodent. They include jumping because the animal is uncomfortable. It's trying to get away from this feeling, wet dog shakes, teeth chattering, lots of pooping. They're really physical signs that we can measure. You can see you get dependent on morphine, but you don't get dependent to your, on your endorphins. Physical signs of dependence. Right, so that is a scientific example, a rodent example of this phenomenon of tolerance and dependence to morphine, but not tolerance and dependence to endorphin. So if we can figure out why endorphin isn't addictive, and I'm using this in air quotes here, because I'm not really measuring addiction here, I'm measuring analgesic tolerance, so tolerance to the pain relieving effects, and physical signs of dependence. Can we do, could we do better? Could we make opioid drugs that behave like this instead of like that? All right, so what's different? Obviously, I'm standing here because UC Davis hired me a year ago because I think we figured it out. And so I'm gonna take you through a little bit of what we think is going on and how we might be able to do better. So how do endorphin and morphine signal, and by that I mean send the signal from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell at this mu opioid receptor? Right, so there's the green ball again, that's endorphin, binding to the receptor, you saw the confirmation change there, right? Doop, lock is closed, lock is open, right? That's signaling to this protein, we're just gonna call it A, it's a G protein, but just call it A, right? Signals to A, because the lock has been turned. It also signals to B, to turn the, the lock off. So A is the light here, and B is blocking A and turning off the light, right? So we have on, off, on, off, on, off, that's how endorphins signal in neurons. And again, they signal in neurons this way, because, and that makes great sense for me as a biologist because you have to have a way to sense that the endorphins are there, and then you have to have a way to turn it off so that you can sense the next time the endorphins come around. After this off, the, the, these receptors undergo this process, again, the name doesn't matter, called endocytosis. That just means they get sucked into the cell. And so you have this cycle where receptors turn on, they turn off, they get endocytosed, and then they are ready and waiting to get turned on again. Right? So that's what happens with endorphin. We call that being balanced, signaling to both A and B, or unbiased, because it's signaling to both A and B. That's what your endorphins do in your body every time that you have them released by your neurons. Right? So this is just the A signal, and this is the B signal showing you that they do this, this change in electrical, they cause this change in electrical activity in neurons, and they make the receptors move from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. Right? That's what endorphins do. Morphine and all of its derivatives, so this is codeine, Norco, Vicodin, Percocet, all the opioids we take for pain are just derivatives of morphine. They're the gift that nature gave us wrapped up in another color of wrapping paper. They do this job, this job, but they don't do this job. They do A, but they don't do B. And our hypothesis was that the failure of morphine to signal in this balanced way, the way that endorphins do, A and B, was responsible for the tolerance and dependence to the drugs. Right? And all the drugs that we take for pain, the exogenous drugs we take for pain, look like this. They look like morphine. They do A but they don't do B. So does bias matter? So if you're me and you make this bold hypothesis, you have to have a way to prove it. And we can do that by using lots of different drugs. We can do that by, but again, those of you who know anything about drugs knows that every drug is a different creature. It has a different half-life in your body. It has a different ability to cross the blood-brain barrier. It has all sorts of different things. So what we did was we changed the receptor in the mouse itself. Right? We made the mouse receptor different. So here's the data I already showed you, tolerance to morphine but not endorphin, and here's that B signaling here, no signaling from B, but we get 
B signaling with enkephalin, with methadone, with endorphin, and, and so there's a correlation here by changing drugs that this hypothesis might be the right thing. But what we did is we made a, a mouse with a different receptor. So here's the, the normal mouse, here's the B signaling with endorphin, but no B signaling with morphine, and here's our mutant mouse where we've changed some things down here in ways that aren't important, where now morphine looks like endorphin. All right, so now morphine does A and morphine does B. Just like endorphin does B, now morphine does B. And we can take mice, brothers and sisters, that either have this receptor or that receptor and give them morphine and ask what happens. So what happens? So here they are, here's our little mice, here's our wild type mouse, and in red, our mutant fancy Whistler Lab genetically engineered mouse. And we can look at analgesia, so that's pain relief. Tolerance, that's do I lose my pain relief activity. And dependence, those are physical signs of, of withdrawal in these two flavors of mice that are brothers and sisters where everybody's getting morphine. And what we found was that morphine is a great painkiller in our mice, right? so just as great, in fact, even better in our mice than in the normal wild type mice. So we haven't compromised therapeutic utility and they don't become tolerant, and they don't become dependent. Right, so these mice have all the benefits of morphine, pain-killing relief, and as I'm about to show you, the reward is intact too, but they don't become tolerant and dependent. And the only thing we've changed here is the ability of the receptor to signal to B. So what about addiction? Now I saw you tolerance, I've told you dependence. What about addiction? I'm not actually gonna show you any slides about addiction today, but I'm gonna show you slides about reward. So raise your hand if you think that rewarding, th again, I've already asked you this question. Raise your hand if you think if something is rewarding, it's going to be addictive. <laughs> right, so this is how we measure that. So we're gonna ask about, do you like it? We're gonna, that's, is it rewarding? Yep. And then we're gonna ask you, do you hate withdrawal? So do you hate being without your drug? And again, the details here are less important. The way we test this is in a box with a mouse where there are two sides to this box with different contextual cues. So there's a different texture on the floor, there's a different wallpaper on the wall, there's a different scent on each side, and we give them animal morphine on one side. Then we give the animal saline or vehicle on the other side. And then the next day, they don't have any drug on board. We just put them back in this box and we say, where do you spend your time? And the animals are going to spend their time in a side where they had a good experience or avoid a side where they had a bad experience. And that's what we call that conditioned place preference or conditioned place aversion if we're looking for a bad effect. And what you see is that wild type mice like morphine. So up on this, up here is I like it. If you're below this line, you means I didn't like it, right? So they like morphine. The wild type mice like morphine. Our mice like morphine. They actually like it even better. So it's as rewarding, if not more rewarding, in our mutant mice. Again, these are the mutant mice that are, don't become tolerant and dependent, but reward and analgesia is intact, All right? So this is gonna be my pitch here, that reward is not addiction, that just because it's rewarding, just because you go up here, doesn't mean you're gonna come down here. You can go up here and come back down to your shoulders multiple times without ever becoming an addict. So our mice show enhanced morphine reward, then we ask the question about how much did you hate being without your drug, right? So let me remind you, our mice love morphine. Do they hate being without morphine? So here in black are the mutant animals and in red, uh, and black are the wild type animals and red are the mutant animals. You can say the wild type animals hate being without morphine. Our animals could care less that, we, that you took it away. So they love morphine, but you can take it away and they're just fine. So that is much closer to what is face value for me, addiction. That is, my hands are on my waist. Here my hands are still on my shoulders. Here my hands are on my waist. All right, so can we find new drug, like molecules, that look like endorphin? That is the goal, right? We should be looking for opioids that look like endorphin. So we're looking for these, and we're looking for new and optimizing new compounds like this, and nobody else is, because they're all either focusing on morphine or things that are like morphine instead of focusing on things that are like this. So this is morphine, 1804. This is heroin, 1874.
This is codeine, Vicodin, Dilaudid, Oxycontin. Again, this is how long ago before we were really trying to do anything different. Okay, fentanyl, 1960. So we tried a little bit in the 60s to do something too. But this is the last time we tried to do something different with this target, with these drugs. And the second part of this, the, the basic research science part of this, as me as a basic scientist as opposed to a drug developer, which is what I am, right? A basic scientist trying to solve mysteries is what are the changes in the brain specific to addiction? And our mice are the perfect tool to do this because we have mice that do and don't become addicted to morphine. So any change in the brain that happened because you saw morphine is gonna happen in both animals, but the changes that are specific to being an addict are gonna happen here and not there. And with that, I'm gonna uh, thank my team and all of my funding sources that have helped me and these are just all of my funding sources that I've had over the last 20 years and the team that's currently in my lab and take any questions that you might have. Thanks. Uh, you mentioned uh, you mentioned a list of, of the list of drugs. Uh, I've heard a lot about oxycontin and oxycodone. Are those also on that list? Yes, they are. So they are just derivatives of morphine. They look they're again, if I can call up that slide briefly. It's. Anyway, yes, it's just a derivative of morphine. It's the morphine molecule that has been changed to change how long, how it gets metabolized in your body. That's essentially what these drugs are. All of them are what we call biased, signal to A but not to B. Can you explain how um, sex addiction fits into this? That's like Tiger Woods, like how is that? You said endorphins are not similar to morphine? Yeah, so again, there's lots of things we do that are reinforcing that we do in a repetitive way, video games, gambling, these are non-drug related things, right? So again, the Tiger Woods is a combination of both sex addiction and he was using opioids, right, for pain. And in most cases, that's the case. In most of these cases where we have an underlying addiction to gambling or not in kids with video games yet, but often it is because you've used, lots of kids are on these dopaminergic drugs for long periods of time for ADHD, and we don't know how that changes your brain. But in the adult population, in the vast majority of cases, there's been both drug use, either opioid use or some other drug use, together with either gambling or sex or some of these other things. Okay, so I noticed there will be a lot more questions. Uh, Jennifer will be available after, but we can get to the but we're running a little bit late. So we're going to go ahead and do our last, our last talk, and then we'll